Welcome. I am so happy to be here. I am Rasheen Roper Robinson, and we're going to have an amazing time this morning yeah. celebrating with the Book Industry Association of Jamaica and the Grassroots Community Foundation Week Outreach. I just want to offer a fair few words about the reason for which we're here and really the, the, the core purpose for which we're here is because of books, books and kids, right? Two things which at all times ought to be inextricably linked together. And so when we're here, we're talking about the fact that we believe in doing everything that we can to ensure that our literacy levels increase, that our children continue to have access to books, that our children continue to have access to information that will really and truly solidify them in who they are, um, powerful, contributing persons to this society. Let us welcome Mrs. Latoya West Blackwood, one of the persons who are the reason, is the reason why we're here this morning. Thank you. So my introduction of myself is that I am a person who loves to re read, write, and serve, right? And I'm a mom. I heard somebody said mother at the back. That's a very important role to me. Now, Jamaica has produced some of the world's award-winning writers, like this very small country. We have done phenomenal things on the global stage. Kai Miller, who some of our kids may or may not know, is the first black person, not Jamaican alone, to win what we call the Forward Prize for Poetry. How many, anybody in the room knew that? It's a big, big prize. <laughs> Most people have heard of Marlon James because of the Booker Prize, you know, maybe being much more of a global prize, but the Forward Prize is just as prestigious. And he's the first black person in the entire world that won that prize, <laughs> right? That's just one, right? And so for me, as a publisher, as a mother, as a Jamaican, I think that it's very important, especially in the present and the future that we face for us to really look at a vision for literacy and how that is connected to our everyday lives. This project, as in this act of doing book bags, which last year we call literacy care packages under the context of COVID, um, is really about I think it's a lot of things, but one of the main things was giving children access, direct access to books and engaging them to let them know that through the pages of books there is hope, first of all, because I think even with the reopening of school there has been a lot of emphasis on let's get back to passing exams yes. and, you know, we're not really checking on the mental health of our children and we know that bibliotherapy, that's a real word, I didn't <laughs> come up with it, right? It's a way to connect with children on the issue of mental health. For me, as a five-year-old, I remember falling in love with books. I never traveled to another country until I was a teenager, and I traveled to many places through the pages of books before I went on a plane. We were doing 40 schools across all 14 parishes. Isn't that amazing? Yes. And, you know, Janice will expound in her thank you, but all the logos you see on here are people who contributed in some way, shape, or form to us being able to have this be a reality. So to wrap up my contribution this morning, I just wanted to say that, you know, in the context of Education Week, we had Read Across Jamaica Day on Tuesday. Our work is not just limited to this week, but we thought that it would be a very important time and space to essentially just remind people of the power of reading to transform lives and communities and demonstrate how working together, collaborating, can help us to reach more people, more communities. So, Mr. Adelson, we welcome you to give your greetings now. Please make him welcome. Thank you so much for the introduction, Rasheen. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to have you all here today at the U.S. Embassy Kingston. We're here at the Robeson American Center, of course, named for uh, one of my heroes, an American hero, uh, Paul Robeson. Um, it's, it's special to be here in person with y'all after all this time having to be apart. Um, American centers, where we are right now, globally are spaces for reading, learning, creating, and innovating. 
And it's my pleasure to endorse Read Across, Read Across Jamaica Day 2022, which encourages us all to enjoy the fundamental human right to literacy and lifelong learning. This right is something that both the governments and people of Jamaica and the United States agree needs to be encouraged, provided, and protected. The act of reading is an exercise of power by each person because if used correctly, reading can change lives. Reading is a way to communicate ideas. We first understand our world through stories told to us or read to us by our parents and our teachers. Uh, but once we start to read for ourselves, we can choose how to engage and explore our world. Reading helps us connect to each other and understand another viewpoint. These connections often form friendships and deter conflicts. Uh, many of us here may remember sending a physical letter or a postcard in the physical mail at a post office between family members uh, and friends. But today, a, a WhatsApp message, an email, uh, a TikTok, a Snapchat, a social, you know, social media, Instagram, uh, those posts connect writer, the writer and the reader across multiple miles, perspectives, and through translation technology, uh, even through language barriers. Reading has been characterized as a key, a tool, a portal, and a maker of full men and women alike. In this way, it shapes societies for generations. Um, you know, I first want to thank all the parents that are here, all the teachers, all the organizers that are here, the sponsors. Um, I'm happy to have Marley here with us today, uh, who you're going to hear from quite soon. But uh, someone like Marley is, a, is an example of being a young person and being able to make a difference at a young age because, you know, she, she saw something that she was interested in. And she said, hey, I want to, I want to do this. I, I want to share my interest with other people. So I thank you, I thank all the sponsors. Um, and to the students, where, could you please raise your hand? <laughs> One thing I wanna say to you guys, uh, to the students, is the fact that you have your parents here, the fact that you have your teachers here, you have adults in your life um, that are supporting you is something that not everyone has the opportunity to have. Half the battle in life is really having someone that cares for you. So the fact that you have those folks in your life is something that you should really not take for granted. Um, and it's something that I hope you, you realize is special. And by you all being here today, you are already showing that you're not necessarily just the average student, you're not just the average kid. You really care about your education, you really care about your future. So thank you all for coming here today um, and, and joining us at the U.S. Embassy. Um, I'll leave you all with this in mind. Promoting literacy across themes from reading to calculations in mathematics and critical thinking skills is critical for our societies. Reading fundamentally stimulates innovation, provides context for stable and secure communities through connection, and creates the right environment for productivity and self-determination of persons and countries alike. Uh, let's make some time to read today and every day. Thank you all, uh, have a lovely day, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the speakers. We're going to hear from Courtney Greaves now. She is a student from the Jessery Paul Primary School, and she's going to bring a cultural item to know where, to us now. We're very excited to hear from you, Courtney. Please make your way. Please make her feel very welcome. I am a Jamaican by Courtney Greaves. I am a Jamaican, a proud one too. I wear the colors of my flag with pride you should wear them too. The colors in my flag speak of who I am. Black is my strength. Green speaks of my hope. Gold is the sunlight in me. When tourists visit Jamaica, they ask for we national dish. We sweet, sweet ackee and salt fish make them lick them lips. I am a Jamaican, the chosen generation of 2030 and beyond. Be careful what you say to me. Be careful what you do to me. I am the future. I am the vision. Courtney, Courtney, you tricked me. You tricked me real good. 
No, Courtney. I see you sitting there. I call your name and you go so sheepishly put up your hand. And then you took off the mask and then Courtney, you tricked me. Who we were all tricked? Bamboozled. I was just about to ask you, Courtney. Who wrote that? I did. Give her a clap, guys, ladies and gentlemen. Courtney, that was extremely awesome. Yeah, really very beautiful. I commend you and I encourage you to keep writing, right? And the more you read, you know, this is the thing too, you know, this is a little thing. I don't know if them tell you. You see, the more you read, is the more your creativity kind of explodes and more you get more inspiration to write more, to see the world from different angles and to write different things and so on. So keep reading, keep writing, keep performing. But So now we're going to hear from... Uh, Marley Dias, the founder of 1000 Black Girl Books and Read Across Jamaica, just Read Across, right, Read Across America Ambassador. Um, she's going to come and she's going to make a presentation at this time. All right, Marley, make her welcome. Thank you all so much. I'm very happy. So this is a this is a very fun day for me. I haven't been back to Jamaica in in about four years, and I wasn't in high school the last time I was here. I was here for the Kingston Book Festival, and to know that I get to come here not necessarily one last time, definitely not one last time, but before school is over means a lot to me. So as Read Across America's ambassador, I am honored to help the National Education Association spark a love of reading among kids of all ages and foster community around diverse books. The largest professional employee organization in the United States is NEA, and its members recognize that good reading skills are the cornerstone to success. But kids need not only to master the skill of reading, but they need to experience its joys. Research shows that the more children read outside of school for fun, the better they do in school. And that's why NEA members who are committed to advancing the cause of public education and driving home the message of reading and its importance and funness, even if that's not really a word, uh, annually sponsor NEA's Read Across America. Uh, and that's why in 2004, NEA made a gift of books. Sorry, my stomach is grumbling. <laughs> made a gift of books for students. It's been a long day. I came here at 4.30 yesterday, but uh, it's made a gift of books to students uh, in Shiloh Primary School in St. Elizabeth uh, to help launch Read Across Jamaica's initiative. So NEA's Read Across America salutes the ongoing efforts of Read Across Jamaica and those organizations like the Jamaican Teachers Association, the Book Industry Association of Jamaica, and the Grassroots Community Foundation uh, who work together to generate enthusiasm for reading nationwide and focus attention to bringing kids together with books where they can see themselves and be the heroes of the story. Books and stories are tools that all children need to discover themselves and shape their own narrative. NEA's Read Across America is honored to contribute books and to be a part of the relationships that kids, teachers, librarians, parents, and other caring community members are building today through reading. And that's why I am so happy to, uh, to present on behalf of the National Education Association and as the ambassador of Read Across America, excuse me, <laughs> a check for $10,000 to Read Across Jamaica Day and to the Read Across America Initiative. This is for my favorite, Miss LaToya. Thank you so much for bringing me here four years ago, and I am so happy to present this to you. Please come up. This is so, wow. I, I heard it was a poster at first, and then. <laughs> so I, I, I feel a little bit overwhelmed because it, it really is a, a welcome gift to us in terms of the fact that a lot of the work that the Book Industry Association does is really volunteer. <laughs> so we know what that means in Jamaican context, right? It's people literally um, using their privilege in terms of your resources and your networks. For me, calling on friends like Sabrina. <laughs> So we have two very good Sabrinas in here. So Sabrina, who is from Charles Chocolates, um, and many other good people who believe in what we're doing. And to have this investment from NEA through you, Marley, as their ambassador, is something that we really appreciate. We have lots of ideas and projects <laughs> that will easily absorb um, this funding. And we look forward 
revealing those plans in the near future um, in terms of how we're going to use this funding because there's a lot of work to be done. And so thank you, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we should always be reading something. Yeah. We might not get the opportunity to sit, right, and palaver or whatever, and lay, really lay back and read all day, but we should always be reading a few pages a day. Well, I was gonna tell, first I was gonna tell a short story about my experience with reading because I think for a lot of people, especially young kids, it's hard to see and like, and the, you know, it's hard to understand why a person might be so passionate about one thing and wanna stick with it for so long because I've been collecting books for seven years. And I think especially as a kid, it takes a lot to do something for seven years. I, I don't think I've even washed my hair or washed my face for seven years straight yet. I, I don't have that consistency with most things, but when I was younger, uh, my mom used to she used to run this camp called Super Camp, and we would always have to memorize poetry. So we would I'm, I was able to memorize the complete I Have a Dream speech, Malcolm X's speeches. I would help every other girl memorize their poetry. But when it came to the last day of camp, when we would all wear these pretty white dresses and we would prepare these dances and these yoga poses and everything, as soon as I had to go up and do my poems, I would start crying. And not even like a little bit of crying. Like I'm not crying, my legs are shaking. Like I look like I'm gonna pee myself. Like I'm fully embarrassed. But I would be able to perform the entire poem, even as I was crying. I would do the entire thing, but I would just be crying. And you just have to deal with it. Like this is the way that I perform. And uh, those the words of those speeches always moved me a lot when I was a kid. Reading poetry was really helpful for me. But I never felt like I could do it too. I always felt this sort of overwhelming sense of emotion that the story was not my story. And as I got older and I started to read books like a book called Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson, I finally felt like this voice and this story was mine to tell and that I didn't have to cry when I was telling it, that I could just be myself. Uh, and reading has given me the gift of my voice, which is really powerful to what I do. And if I didn't have this voice, if I didn't have this story, if I couldn't speak you know, with the sort of confidence that I have, even though I still get emotional and get nervous, uh, I don't know what I would be able to do. And I don't know if 13,000 books would have been collected. I don't know if a Netflix show would have been made. I don't know if, you know, I'd be able to speak at the DNC or to get to meet young kids and to get to come back to Jamaica and continue to do this work. So I thank books for my voice. And if I didn't have my voice, if I didn't see myself, I know that I would be that same kid that continues to cry and to not want to speak and to not want to fight through their anxieties, their nervousness, whatever it is. So it's really important to me to do this work and to do it in a country that is not my country, but also is my country. Yeah. My name is Marley. Like, my name is Marley. Like, that's not, that wasn't an accident. Uh, and it's really important to me to get to do this. So I want to open it up to say thank you to all the readers out there, to all the organizers here that helped me, you know, be here today and to the kids that are here. It really means a lot to me to see other kids that are engaged and to know that we have performers, we have people who don't cry when they do poetry, which is great. You know, I was a crier, so I'm really proud of you. Uh, and to open it up to any questions you guys have, but to offer my own personal thank yous to see kids with that voice and to know that there's a future for storytellers and for black girl storytellers. It really means a lot to me. <laughs> Do we have any questions? <laughs> we have any questions? I'll take questions. Okay, we have questions. I'll take your question. <laughs> Why am I crying? That's a great question. <laughs> Thank you. I do have a question. Okay. You first. You got it. Tell me your name, your age, and then ask your question, please. You can't walk her. Um, 10 years old. Nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> just your thoughts, I marry you. For, for someone who wouldn't like reading at all, just wouldn't want to pick up a book and read, how would you encourage them to read? Like, how, how do you motivate them? That's a great question. So one of the ways that we always try to do this is through showing kids the possibility of reading. So for example, there are some books that kids don't want to read at all, right? So there's this book that was assigned in my school called The Outsiders. Nobody wanted to read The Outsiders. Everyone was so mad that we had to read the book, but then they found out that there was a movie 
for the book. <laughs> and one way that we try to help kids that don't like to read is to show them the opportunities of what these stories create. So sometimes, it, uh, oftentimes, our favorite TV shows, our favorite movies are based off of books. So we try to read them at the same time. So we'd read a chapter of The Outsiders, and then we'd watch the first 30 minutes of the movie. And I also created a, and worked on and created a show called Bookmarks, which is on Netflix, which is available all throughout the world, where we both have these actors that are performing these stories. They're reading them with such confidence. Uh, and the book is live in the, in the screen behind us as it's, the pages are turning. We're seeing these stories out loud. We're hearing music. So oftentimes, it's just trying to show and, and have educators really work with kids to understand that books are art, that this is a performance, this is a story, and it's not just for an assignment. There are no questions, there are no tests, there's no grades, but it's just a creative exploration. Um, and oftentimes, it's complementing these stories with movies and with music that we can get kids to read, even if they don't want to read at all. So thank you. That was a great question. So the way I got the, the idea for 1,000 Black Girl Books, uh, it was through actually a problem I had when I was in fifth grade. So what would fifth grade be? Fifth grade would be? Fifth grade? Okay, so, okay, so um, I was in fifth grade, and I had looked in my, my class library, and I really, really loved to read, and my teacher loved to read to us. But we had read this book called um, Shil the Shiloh series, so it was three books about this young boy who lived in the South and had this wonderful dog that he had a great connection with, and it was a really nice story that we got to read. And my teacher, he would sit on, on his desk or stand on his desk and read to us and just give us these like amazing performances of it. And then we, then we finished those books and we read Where the Red Fern Grows by Wilson Rawls, which is another book about a young boy from the South who has this amazing connection with his dog and works through all his tragedies and emotional pain with his dog. And I had found these performances and like my teacher's teachings so moving and so great. But I noticed that my teacher was a young boy from the South who had a great emotional connection with his dog and had worked through his issues with his dog. So I was, think, I was seeing that my teacher was only able to give a mirror to us of his own experiences. That the only books he wanted to teach, the only messages that he was willing to share were those of his own. And even though he did a great job with them, it was unfair to other students that young black kids were not able to see themselves as those same leaders, as those same people that you know have these friendships, that can fall in love, that can be architects, that can be presidents. Um, and to know that a lot of these messages that he was willing to and open to send were not diverse, were not showing other people's stories, really frustrated me. And I kind of kept that secret inside of me in fifth grade. I didn't want to start you know, any sort of fight about it because I loved my teacher and I thought he was a really nice guy. But what he was doing was not fair to the other students and was not fair to readers. Um, so then the next year, I kind of, you know, I let that story go. I'm like, okay, whatever, like this is a bad, you know, it's bad, but it's okay. In my sixth grade year, all of my friends are reading Where the Red Fern Grows, that same book, again. So it was assigned two years in a row, and that was when I had a complete problem. And I was like, we know we have resources in our school. We have money to get new books. We have a great curriculum. We have these resources. Kids need to see themselves, and they need to see themselves now. So I go to my mom, I ran, and I complained to her about this in our local diner, was eating pancakes, and she asked me, well, what are you gonna do about it? Because I continued to complain for an hour and a half, making her sit there, and I had no plan on doing anything but complaining to her. So she encouraged me to take another step between just seeing this problem and having this passion for reading and doing something about it that would not only help myself, but help others. Because I could obviously go to the bookstore, buy black girl books, and keep them for myself, but this is about our community. This is about our schools. You know, the way that I'm impacted by a lack of diversity is not the same way that another kid is impacted by a lack of diversity. If some kids don't see themselves ever, they will never speak up. They will never want to be leaders. They will not believe in their own ability to succeed. And to think about the consequences that a lack of diversity has in our schools was really important to me and pushed me to do something beyond just my own experience. So I decided that I was going to collect 1,000 books where black girls were the main character, and I wanted to donate them to the school that my mom had attended in Retreat St. Mary. Um, and we were able to do that over November of 2015 to February of 2016 
um, and we've just continued since. There are so many kids out there that do not see themselves, sadly, and there are so many stories that need to be told, and 1,000 Black Girl Books really comes out of this need to create mirrors and windows so that young black girls can see themselves as these leaders, and people who are not black girls understand and respect the identities of who we are, especially in such a big and sometimes often scary world where if we don't educate ourselves and read, what do we have? What understandings do we have? Are we kind enough? Um, we think that books, and I believe that books, give us the tools and resources to do better for ourselves uh, and to do better for each other. Thank you. It's not a question, but my school, the library, it isn't fully open to children, but usually used for PTA meetings or shows. Thank you for sharing that with me, first of all. And I want you to know that we are working, as of this morning, we are going to be making very serious, and this is what I said, very serious efforts towards making sure that all of the 130 plus libraries that are available here in Jamaica are open to kids all the time and even have snacks and have nice movies and have treats and maybe ice cream because we know that kids need their libraries. I'm sure you want to go to the library, right? Yes, miss. Don't try to call me miss. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> Do you have a favorite book? Well, it's... I can't remember the name, but it's not a reading book, but a book filled with poems. It's, it, it had gold in it, but I can't exactly remember the full name. We'll get you more poetry books. Okay, you have a question? It's not necessarily a question, but I want to, ex I want to tell you how, how books actually impacted me during a hard time. Um, about two or three years ago, my mother had a heart attack and two strokes, and I ended up breaking up down, and I was actually a lot chubbier than this. I would basically be the heaviest person in my cl class, and when I found out that my mo mother would have maybe died two years ago, well, I broke down and I lost all the weight. Then my teacher introduced me to this, to this book of a little girl just like me that had the same passion for books and reading that I did. And the book really empowered me and it brought me through, through the tough time. And I also was more experienced to the Bible and it really impacted me. Now my mother is out and about, well, she's using a wheelchair right now. But I don't, I'm just thankful to God that she is alive. Wow. I think everyone in here is crying. I think every single adult in here is crying. You're so beautiful, and thank you for sharing that. We really appreciate it. I'm going to cry too. But do we have any students that have any stories they'd like to share about how reading affects them, or any questions for me? This is, okay, this is, well, we have a new one. I'm gonna, I'll come back. I'll come back. So, well, right now I'm impacted by books because when I'm reading them, it feels like I'm just in the book. I just read and read and read. It's just so fun. Oh, yes. We love to hear that. And there are more books coming your way, of course. Uh, and through our donation that we, we gave to, as, a, as the Read Across America ambassadors, we want to make sure that every kid has books all the time in Jamaica because you all deserve to be in your stories, seeing yourself, and loving to read. Can you say your name and your age? My name is Emily, and I am eight years old. Um, so my question is, how did you get the motivation to start a thousand black girls? Great question, one. So the the motivation for 1,000 Black Girl Books, really, it comes from me knowing that, you know, other kids don't have the same privileges that I do, you know? That I saw this issue, right, where I didn't see myself in these books. And I knew that I could tell my parents to go to the bookstore and buy me books where Black Girls were the main character, that they would have no problem doing that. But then you have to think about kids that can't afford to go to the bookstore, whose parents don't buy them books in their house, who don't have access to libraries, who don't get these resources. And to think that 
there was a kid there. This is so scandalous that kids don't have access to those resources was really hard to think about. You know, imagine if a kid couldn't, they couldn't see themselves, if they couldn't feel that feeling of being inside of a book, that they had never felt that way, that they hated to read. It was really hard to deal with that feeling and to know that I had the power to do something about it. I had the voice, I wanted to make change, and to think about the kids that wouldn't have access to those resources, it really felt like I would be hurting them if I didn't speak up about it. Because I knew I had that motivation and that drive. And the thing that keeps me going is other kids that start campaigns, that want to collect books, that love to read, that perform poetry, that ask hard questions. <laughs> you know, all these types of kids that feel empowered by reading continue to make me motivated. And the teachers that, you know, tell them about my story and tell them, you know, about who, what I believe in. You know, I realize that every kid in this room, all six of you or seven of you really believe in the power of reading. And there are so many kids out there like that. So why should I be quiet when I know that this issue and this passion is something that so many other kids feel and don't always have the opportunity to speak about? So that's one of the parts of my motivation. And you guys are a huge part of my motivation. I don't cry when I meet other students. I really don't. <laughs> I really have never cried at a student event before. Like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, you all mean so much to me. And to think that anything I do impacts not only my town, but this whole world and this, and this country. It means a lot to me, and that will always keep me going. So, thank you for your question. Thank you very much, uh, Marley, for that sharing and that kind of vulnerability and openness um, and the using of your voice and lending your voice as well to these students and to our students who are here. You guys are so beautiful. I mean, um, Courtney, bless you and your mom, right? Um, I think it's important, too, that you're able to be so aware of and conscious of this, what has happened to you and the work that the book or reading, um, the, the kind of contribution that it has had to your life. I think when I'm in spaces like this, I think to myself, our future is, it looks good. You know, I feel that with all of the things that are going on, and there are many things that are going on outside of this room, but in this room and in this bubble right now, I hold on to the truth that our future is bright. Our future is bright. Thank you so much to our students who are here and our teachers who have brought them. Thank you so much to Marley and um, the Book Industry Association of Jamaica and Grassroots Community Foundation. But we're not finished yet. We are going to have, are you, can you come up here? Are you in us? Are you able, Dr. Dias, to, to come and speak with us this morning? This is our, the president of the Grassroots Community Foundation. She's going to come and move our vote of thanks at this time. Or at least she's going to try yeah, to do try. it. <laughs> try Good. Is it still morning time? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so I rarely cry. Um, but today, it seems to be my, maybe I just need to clean out my eyes. Um, so I am Janice Johnson Dias, and I was born in St. Anne's Bay Hospital and grew up in Retreat St. Mary. And um, when I think about this moment, and what is happening and us being at the embassy um, with my daughter and my husband and my friends and family. Um, I am moved not just to tears, but my heart is really filled with joy. And so I thank you, I thank you, I thank each of you for being here. Um, I will tell you a little bit of story before I say my formal thanks. Um, in Retreat St. Mary, I lived with my grandmother, Margaret Taylor, and I like to call her name in these settings because just a few days ago, my cousin Carol Simmons wrote to me and said, we have put our family on the map. And it's interesting, because if you've been to Retreat, Retreat has about 400 or so people, um, and it's across the bridge. And St. Mary is a unique place. Most of the warriors, that facilitated our emancipation in Jamaica are from St. Mary, right? So St. Mary women 
Now lay down. <laughs> right? Speaking up is a part of our history. True. Michelle Ann Weeks is also from St. Mary. Present. Right? Um, and to hear Marley talk about her voice and the importance of her voice. I write about this in my book, but I really want caregivers, teachers, parents to really hear this thing about voice. Closed mouth, don't get feed. You hear phrases like that, right? You hear in the Bible, people hear a voice. You hear people say, use your voice. But it is very difficult to give value to voice if we don't also listen. If I was not prepared by Margaret Taylor, Monica Dennis, and my family to hear Marley on that day, then her voice would fall on mute ears. We must listen to our young people. We must listen to the words they say and the spaces in between. We must understand that their voice is not our voice. That their way of seeing the world matters. That their understandings of this moment matters. For adults, none of us are picnic in, in 2022, you know. I was a picnic in the 70s and 80s. Their understanding of this moment we need better access to. And that can only happen if we listen to their voices. And that listening and that cultivation of voices happens through books. From 1972 to basically 1984, I read one book, really. We had access to other books, but I don't remember them. But I remember the King James Version of the Bible. I come from very, very meager beginnings. But we always had the Bible. And the Bible is a very good story, set of stories. You get all kinds of things in there. You get action. You get romance. Right? You get friendship. You get consideration. You get some wine up, wine up too. Right? All kinds of things happen in the Bible. Right? And if you couple the Bible with Anansi stories, you get a robust imagination. So by the time I had access to resources in the States, I was really interested in reading. But the gift that Marley has comes from the fact that her beginnings are very different from my beginnings. And the legacies that we can pass on to our children is through books. We are largely people of African descent, and people have kept words from us. They have kept, forcefully, kept us from learning how to read because it is the place where we really can experience the highest form of freedom, our minds and our imagination. I told some kids the other day that we live in people's imagination. The clothes you have on, the shoes you have on, the cars that you drive, people had to imagine it to know. Yes. And then they created industries based on their imagination. We can imagine freedom. We can imagine new societies. And these books will help us do that. They are not simply for the replication of capital. They offer something greater than capital your own liberty and the liberty of the nation and all nation states that exist. So I want to thank you, Marley. You continue to be the gift. I sometimes joke that said, God not paying no attention to me from 1972 to 1980. And so he decided that he was going to come back extra and give me this child. But the gift that she gives me is because I work each day to try to actually hear her. She has more words than me. Truth be told, she may actually be smarter than me. I go, maybe that's too far, too far, too far. Right? <laughs> right? But her father and I wanted to give her something. And that gift, we are so delighted to see that gift pass through the entire world. Once I had access to books, 
I wanted her to share in it, and she just took the baton like a good Jamaican and go too far, right? So I wanna thank you, thank you. I wanna thank all of these people, and I really wanna talk about them and a few in real detail. Last year when I was here, you cut the top, it's fine. You cut the top, you cut off all of my chocolate, right? We're gonna talk about Sabrina. Last year when we were here, we're dragging books, and Sabrina wasn't yet working for Charles, but she was here to ensure that every child got a book. So I wanna big up Charles Chocolate for having a good sense I have for Sabrina, but we really want to pay honor to Sabrina, the person, for making it possible. Look, express print, you have to know, there would be no bags <laughs> without them. So we are very, very grateful, and also to mass production. Let me tell you about the NET, you see? Anybody ever been through customs? <laughs> customs are serious business at all. So NET has made it possible for us to be able to actually have the paperwork. Last, last year, I come here, we have smile upon people. Come on, come on, let me get the books down. We had to do it proper this time, and that was made possible with NET. JetBlue has been an amazing resource. If it were not for JetBlue, the cost of bringing 2,000 books to Jamaica would be just too high for us. But JetBlue, Icema Gibbs in particular, made this possible, our tickets and the bags to be here. They have been an incredible partner to the Grassroots Community Foundation and to the 1,000 Black Girl Books campaign, and we are grateful. But best of all, I cannot leave here without saying thank you to the U.S. Embassy for hosting us. This is a big deal, man. Nobody can chat to me for the rest of the day. And I'm like, <laughs> right? So to know that my adopted home, right? This is an opportunity for my adopted home and my birthland to come together. This is a big deal on the year that I turned 50. This is seminal. It is a part of our birthright to join ourselves across nations and to work and operate as one community. And to Latoya West Blackwood, yes. from all of the job them she have, like a good Jamaican, she have 10 jobs. <laughs> I just want to say thank you and thank you. Latoya decided to join me in this endeavor to always spread out, right, across Jamaica. I was like, 12 schools, clearly we can do better. But I would not have been able to do better if not for the valiant work of all of the ambassadors. They're not all here in Jamaica, but I wanna note them. So representing, right, Portland is Miss Leonie Ford. She took my gobbles yesterday, right? Representing Kingston and St. Andrews is Dr. Nadine France. Representing St. Catherine is Lisa Maxwell, board member. Yeah. Representing all of LES Low East Side Manhattan is <laughs> Sabrina Webb. <laughs> and my family, this is my husband, Scott Dyers. <laughs> and you know, so Ms. Steele, Shelly and already, Shelly and from her flow with St. Mary. Yeah. So we have, I wanna say their names, we have Kevin Moulton, Kev Rock, who has been raising funds for St. Thomas. We also have Dr. Stephanie Marshall Thomas, who's been raising funds for St. Elizabeth. And we have naturalists, as well as uh, Moments, as well as Rocholo, who have been helping Kevin that effort to make sure that other parishes like St. James really come on board. We are so grateful for the larger diaspora community and their efforts to make sure that this happens. And next year, we're really, in terms of really expanding our effort, we want to have books in the hands of all kids in Jamaica. The ideal goal, I will say out loud to you, is that the research set, the research tells us, this is, this is a, we'll say that this is a decade mission. So that way she doesn't fret too much. The research tells us that if each child had 80 books in their home library, that their capacity for being able to be an active citizen and a participatory citizen with the highest level of proficiency would be achieved. 
So the ideal number is 80 books at the minimum in a home library, right? And so when we think about this arc of a decade long in 2032, we could really build that vision to ensure that all kids on this island of less than 3 million people have at least 80 books in their home library. So I, I invite you to participate in this, in this um, broader decade-long goal, and I thank you for making a commitment to help our children love to read, read to love, and learn to read. Thank you. So we have come to the end of our program, everyone. And what a day, what a morning it has been. We've had the opportunity to share with some students. We've had an opportunity to share with Marley, to share with her family, Dr. Dias and Mr. Scott Dias. We've had an opportunity to share with the Book Industry Association of Jamaica and really have a mini conversation and see actively just now the power of books and the power of words. I too buy into that vision, Shelley. It's it, it big, right? <laughs> it's big and it broad, but if nothing else, we know as Jamaicans, we, we're little but, we tell what, so it can do, right? Everything is doable, right? Everything is doable, or figure out as um, Forleo says, it, so it can be done, right? And I underscore that invitation, right? And we can start in our homes. We can start with ourselves. What are you reading now? What are you consuming now? What are the books that you're curating to consume, right? And then after consuming same, how are you going out or how are we going out to change the world around us, right? Because I think that too, you know, that is the rub, that there has to be some kind of action after we have read. Right? And so I continue to encourage you, after you leave this room, everybody, all of you, to continue to read. There's a lot going on, but we can change it, we can impact it, we can, we can just, we can, our imaginations can grow, we can move this world by reading. I believe it. Thank you for checking us out on Good News Jamaica TV for content that informs, inspires, and transforms. Please like, share, leave a comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more positive Jamaica content. What good?